So over to you. A very warm welcome to the sixth lecture and discussion in the Open Health Systems Colloquium series. This series is a collaboration between the Open Health Systems Laboratory and the India International Center. Its goal is to bring together leading thinkers to present life science issues in an effort to provoke innovative, holistic, and paradigm shifting approaches to life sciences. By making the latest developments in biomedical sciences accessible in the public domain, the aim is to spark debate and discussion in a larger cross-disciplinary space. We have a very exciting and inspiring session ahead of us today. Today's discussion is centered around the work of Dr. Douglas Engelbart, a visionary decades ahead of his time who believed that the collective human intelligence is exponentially greater than the individual. And this collective intelligence can be harnessed and augmented using technology. This was also based on his belief that knowledge and information should be open and used to enhance human and community development. We are honored to have with us Dr. Jim Sporer, who will lead today's discussion with his talk in Doug's words, remembering Doug Engelbart. This will be followed by talks by three distinguished speakers, Ms. Christina Engelbart, Dr. Daniel Araya, and Dr. Mei Lin Fang. I welcome all distinguished speakers. We are also honored to have with us Dr. Nandini Kannan, who will chair the discussion today. Dr. Kannan is the executive director of the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum, a bilateral autonomous organization jointly funded by the Indian and United States government. She has a deep commitment to education and workforce development and to the critical role that science and technology play in this global interconnected society. Dr. Kannan has spent over 20 years in academia as Chair, Department of Management Science and Statistics at the University of Texas, San Antonio. She uh, led a university-wide initiative on quantitative literacy. Dr. Kannan has served as Program Director at the US National Science Foundation in the Division of Mathematical Sciences. She has served as Co-Chair for several data science-related activities in support of harnessing the data revolution, one of NSF's 10 big ideas. She helped to create new programs to support data science foundations, as well as data intensive research in the science and engineering domains, and also created partnerships with the National Institutes of Health to support collaborative efforts in biomedical data science. She served on the board of the trustees of the International Indian Statistical Association, IISA, and is a former president of IISA. Before I hand over to Dr. Kannan, I would like to remind the viewers that this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the OHSL site very soon. Questions for the speakers will be taken at the end and please type your questions in the chat box. I now welcome Dr. Kannan and invite her to introduce Dr. Spora and chair this evening's meeting. Over to you, Dr. Kannan. Uh, thank you very much, Koninika, for the introduction. Uh, to all the speakers today, a very warm welcome, and to everybody in the audience, uh, you're in for a real treat today. Uh, so it's a pleasure to chair this session uh, that's organized by the Open Health Systems Laboratory. This is the sixth in their series, and it talks about you know, one of the uh, really visionary figures in American technology, Doug Engelbart. Uh, we have a very, very distinguished panel of speakers, uh, all of whom have had long uh, collaborations and partnerships with Doug. Uh, so I will let them talk about, uh, you know, his vision. And I will just talk a little bit about one of Doug's early influences because I thought it would connect to um, my work at the National Science Foundation. Uh, so as many of you know, uh, Doug Engelbart, uh, one of the major uh, influences in his life was Vannevar Bush, um, who was instrumental in setting up uh, the office of he headed up the office of scientific research and development during the uh, during World War II. Uh, he was former professor and dean of the School of Engineering at MIT, and he was unofficially known as the first presidential science advisor. Uh, so he had a, a very interesting article uh, in the Atlantic. As, it's called "As We May Think," published in July 1945, just after the end of the war, and he talks about. Uh, you know, the impact science has had. And uh, I'm going to read a bit of the quote and you can read the rest yourself. It says, science has provided the swiftest communication between individuals. It has provided a record of ideas, enabled man to manipulate and to make extracts from that record so that knowledge evolves and endures 
throughout the life of a race rather than that of an individual. He also talks about how the summation of human experience is being expanded at a prodigious rate and the means we use for threading through this consequent maze to what is really important uh, is similar to the days of square rig ships. But he says there are signs of a change as new and powerful instrumentalities come into use. And uh, another nice quote there is, the world has arrived at an age of cheap complex devices of great reliability and something is bound to come of it. So this was an article in 1945. And what's interesting is uh, this was an article that Doug read when he was uh, in the war stationed in the Philippines, as I think I read. And he writes a letter to Vannevar Bush and says, I rediscovered your article about three years ago and was rather startled to realize how much I had aligned my sights along the vector you had described. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the reading of this article 16 and a half years ago hadn't had a real influence about upon the course of my thoughts and actions. Uh, so these were two visionaries. Uh, Vannevar Bush started the National Science Foundation. Uh, he was someone who had really thought about the role science and technology would play. Would play. And then Doug sort of took that further and looked at the way human and technology would interact. Next slide, please. So I, I would just like to talk a little bit about uh, the organization I had, as uh, Koninika said, this is a bilateral entity set up by the US and Indian governments. And we've recently launched a US-India AI initiative. Uh, we talk about this as a partnership between the two largest democracies. Uh, we hope this aligns with our shared values of openness, transparency, and reciprocity, and encourages innovation that'll benefit societies in both countries. Uh, the two main pillars, and the reason I bring this up is it, it resonates with the words of Doug and you know, the, the many other individuals who followed Doug's path. We're looking at how we can leverage the power of AI for social good, uh, looking at really important foundational and implementation questions within ethics, privacy, the whole idea of trustworthy AI and explainable AI. At the same time, we also need to look at the second pillar of AI. It's all around data and computing infrastructure. And I know many of uh, the speakers here have had a lot of experience in doing this. How do we have build frameworks for benchmarking, understand issues around data provenance and build data and um, tools commons. So one of the interesting issues that when we start talking about AI is whether we talk about AI or we talk about IA. So this goes back to Doug's work on intelligence augmentation versus artificial intelligence. I think uh, as many of the speakers will talk about today, it's, uh, it's just flipping the two letters, but they mean very different things. Uh, and it's always interesting to read the philosophies that come into play when uh, people are talking about AI versus uh, intelligent augmentation. Uh, so one thing that you know comes up in a lot of these conversations is you know whether this is a zero sum game. If you have one, can you not have the other? Uh, and how do we evolve? You know a process where it's a coevolution. It's another word that Doug used quite a bit: coevolution of technology as well as you know the human abilities. Uh, to expand through the use of these technologies. So is it uh, AI replacing the task or is it augmenting the tasks that humans can do uh, in collaboration? So there's a very nice article that came out recently by David de Kremer and Gary Kasparov. Yes, the chess player. It talks about how AI should augment human intelligence and not replace it. And it, it goes to talk about why it's important for us in in this society to think about ways in which uh, we can co-evolve technologies uh, to advance in, in the support of social good. And you know, talking about automation is something that you know, always comes up, you know, will there be loss of jobs? So we need to think about IA more than we do about AI. And I'm hoping uh, some of the speakers today will talk about that. Um, I will just, I'm looking forward to the discussion, but I just wanted to throw these out as, uh, you know, Vannevar Bush being the major influence in Doug's life, visionaries, 
uh, and especially now in the post-COVID context, when we're talking about technology and how technology is going to change the post-COVID world, uh, these are questions I think we need to revisit. How do we coexist? Um, so with that, I'm going to turn this over. I'll just do a little brief introduction of Jim and uh, we'll get started with the presentation. Uh, so the next slide, please. Great. Uh, so this is Jim in his own words. Uh, Jim received a Bachelor of Science degree in physics from MIT, a PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence from Yale. Uh, and Jim met Doug in the 1990s when he worked at Apple uh, and when he joined IBM in 1998, uh, he asked Doug to speak to the researchers at IBM about his vision, Doug's vision for augmented intelligence. And his ideas have had a big influence in IBM's approach to AI and Watson. And these ideas inspire Jim as he leads IBM's open source data and AI efforts. Uh, so uh, Jim's had uh, a long history with Doug and we're really looking forward to hearing him speak and then uh, Daniel and Mailing after that. So Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Nadidi Kanan. Uh, and thank you, uh, Open Health Systems Laboratory for this opportunity. It's a Memorial Day weekend in uh, the United States and California, and it's great to have this opportunity to remember Doug on this Memorial Day weekend. I'm Jim Spore. I'm here at the Almaden Research Center in San Jose, California, beautiful hills uh, behind us here. Doug came here many times. I invited him here many, many times to talk to our executives, to talk to our researchers about his vision for the future, a very positive vision for the future. And, it's, uh, and it really had a huge influence on IBM's approach to Watson and artificial intelligence, which was an augmented intelligence approach. He also had a great influence on our uh, desire to do more in the open. And it's um, you know, a real honor for me to lead IBM's open source data and AI initiative. Um, this is our agenda. And just uh, briefly, I, after I give my lecture, uh, Christina Engelbar uh, isn't able to join us today, but we've got a wonderful video of her. Christina is Doug's daughter. And then Daniel Arai, who leads a think tank and has done a great deal of work on augmented intelligence and augmented learning. So we're looking forward to hear uh, Daniel's comments. And Maylin Fung, longtime uh, collaborator with uh, Doug, uh, Maylin and I spent uh, many, many uh, great afternoons and evenings over at Doug's brainstorming uh, with uh, Christina and Doug and others. So it's a great pleasure to have this uh, spectacular lineup of discussions. Um, so today's lecture, in Doug's own words, it's going to be kind of like a cooking show. <laughs> I've, I've got video clips of Doug talking about three things uh, similar to the talks that he gave here at IBM uh, Research Almaden. And the, there's a couple themes that run through these talks. One is long before there was the Agile method, every single IBMer today has to know the Agile method. But long before the Agile method, we had something called Engelbart's Improvement of Improvement. And Doug dedicated his life to helping humankind uh, develop its collective IQ to co-evolve an augmentation system that had a human part and a technology part to address complex, urgent problems. So the first video clip we're going to see is really about Doug as a human being and, um, and dedicating his life to this life mission. Then the second video clip, we're going to learn what is an augmentation system? What is the human part? What is the tool part? It seems like the tool part can change quickly. The human part changes more slowly. But Doug's view is both have far more potential than, we're, than people imagine. And he was way ahead of his time, a visionary in that. Then we're going to hear about improving organizations through network improvement communities. And last but not least, this issue of AI versus intelligence augmentation. So let's Get into it. And so now I would like to start the first video and let's hear from Doug. Besides the, um, the, fact, the fact that most of my things sprung from a particular quest I've been after and a framework that I developed to think about it. So I'm going to focus on that quite a bit. And some of it is conceptual and not technical. So just put that, though, to give you some reality that if it's possible to hang that on to 
I'm going to dive into some of the technology early and then go to the concepts and then go to a little bit more technology. And I kind of with concepts for if I don't finish all the slides, I still get to it. So that's one of my real failings is I, I start talking and I get Gabby about sharing what it felt like and I don't get through the whole program. I'd like to talk. So let's start with the first slide, please. When I was in 19, just about this time, 30, 40, 35 years ago, I got this big kick that I'm going to do something meaningful. And uh, that, that was 1950. And I went through a whole bunch of analysis that I outlined a little bit in that paper and came up with a big flash about, hey, you know, the world really is in a pickle. Our complexity of our problems is growing and growing very fast. And the urgency with which we have to deal with them is also increasing. And that the product of urgency and complexity essentially is a measure of the difficulty for humans in coping with problems. So what happens when that difficulty surpasses our capability and we get farther and farther behind in coping with them? So I looked around and I realized, well, in 1950 or 51, we already were too far behind. So if there was something that a young man could do to, to help humanity cope better with complexity and urgency, that would be a nice contribution. So all right, I commit. So Doug committed at a very early age, 1950s, 1951, he committed his life to helping humankind prepare for the complex, urgent problems that were coming at it uh, faster and faster. And the way uh, Doug approached uh, helping humanity prepare to address these complex, or urgent problems was through something he called an augmentation system. So let's learn from Doug, in his own words, uh, what is an augmentation system? Okay, those things mostly are developed in order so they can interact with this layer of other things that our culture provides us. Okay, there are a lot of things in there that are brought to you, tools and all sorts of stuff that let you live within a social structure and be effective at your interacting. And there's a whole subset of those that help you be effective at your working with knowledge work, et cetera, too. So take all those things together and call them an augmentation system. That's what augments humans. And for good practical purposes, let's make two parts of that. One side's got all the technology in it, and the other side has all the other stuff. So I call it tool system and human system. All right, training, knowledge and skills that you got to install, language, an extremely important invention. It just transcends as an invention anything yet we come up with here. The methods and all that we use to knit together all the little steps that we can take ourselves during the day are extremely important. Our customs for working, our procedures, the way our organizations are done. They're all done so that humans can do something. So you look and say, <clears throat> within that sort of picture framework, any given capability that a human has is really composite. It's made up of making use of a lot of these things and a lot of these things with kind of skills and here and training and conditioning and the uh, all the customs and the things you just accept and all the mental skills and the language that you've learned in here. So that's the kind of thing. It's like we've got to work on boosting people's capability. So along comes a lot of new technology here, and that's great. But the technology side alone isn't what's going to really make all the difference. So let's just go on a little bit more with the kind of picture. These were all in words in 1962, so this is since then kind of way to graphically talk about it. <clears throat> so look, at our, our real capabilities are sort of essentially hierarchical. You know, we learn a lot of lower order capabilities like writing and typing and reading, et cetera, like that. And then you've got higher capabilities you build on top of those and on up until you're reading, that's you as an individual, a bag of capabilities, or that's an organization and the capabilities it has at many level. <clears throat> so if we bring in something in here, you know, a, a longer lasting pen, it's going to make a little bit of an effect. But you bring in the kind of technology that, even in 62, 60, it was just clear to me the kind of things were going to happen. Incidentally, because I'd had this strange obsession. And by the way, before there was Moore's Law, there was Engelbart's Law, Doug understood the accelerating change of technology. But unlike many, he also saw there's huge potential in people. People have enormous potential. And uh, when we get to Daniel's talk, he'll, he'll mention some things, I'm sure, about augmented learning. And this is really key. Doug's vision included both these parts. Too many times people are just focused over here and they don't get the full augmentation system. So Doug makes a little joke about that next, which uh, I find funny. And I realized by the late 50s that it sounded very weird. It doesn't take much cleverness to realize that in the face of the kind of reaction I was getting. <laughs> but um, So I got the chance before I could work on this to, uh, to do some semi-theoretical work about what was the potential for digital complementary as far as the uh, scaling in its size and speed went. <clears throat> you know, I really learned a lot, opened up that, did dimensional analysis of it, and began to realize that we, you know, we scale things down and the limit of how small and how fast the things can get is very, very small and very, very fast. <clears throat> and uh, the, the, don't worry, with the kind of pressure that was apparently going to be there economically and all for driving digital, digital stuff, 
and it's going to have these kind of curves like they've been talking about. So great. And it's going to take a long time to learn how to make all these changes over in this side of the world. So start gearing up and experimentally get the best things you can moving here and start learning about the changes in here because that's going to be the really long time constant to make the change. So let's go. So that was the framework in 62 when I was starting to say, hey, I want to do things. And um, one of the things to look at in here and realize that most of what you hear about today and all of that is heavily, heavily emphasized in here. There's a strong intuitive feeling that that's going to make a difference. And you can even see in today's ways of doing things, yes, they can come in and make immediate changes. So this side of this two-part system has really been driving it. So what I've – just this morning, someone <laughs> – I got this great thing. It's a, these are semi-augment semi people, <laughs> you know, semi-conductor people. So anyway, that's only part of the story. And what you have to do is the co-evolution between these things. And uh, so how do you make an environment that gets the coevolution? Well, that's where all the bootstrapping and the laboratory I said I wanted to do, et cetera. And he did set up the laboratory. Uh, he did set up, uh, he in, invented the mouse. He did the 1968, the mother of all demos that showed how people and their skills can learn uh, to use these new devices. Imagine the first time you used a mouse. I mean, kids grow up with it now, but, you know, I remember using a mouse and it was like, how do I do this? And, and so the human side has to evolve with the tool side. And again, Doug's vision of um, collective IQ increases, he has as much faith in our ability as people to advance our culture, our methods, our language, our learning as the technological side. So let's go now to learn a little bit more about A, a activities, B activities, C activities, um, and how uh, improvement communities work. So let's listen to Doug again in his own words. Collective IQ of any country in the world would be country X. So you can imagine there should be a real race to be the smartest one to strategically go after being the smartest country in all of these elements. It's business, it's education, it's healthcare, it's legislation, it's executive work, it's judicial work. We're not going to get there by just watching the marketplace work the way it does. The marketplace there isn't a driving function to produce the most effective corporation. The driving force is to produce and gain market sales. And, and there's a lot of lost opportunity that's going to be very expensive in the following decades if we don't go after it. So this one is trying to show uh, in one sort of picture the essence of the strategies that we've been talking about. And uh, in this strategy, we look at a given organization, one or two or in as different organizations that are you can think of like one is India and two is the United States and all of the different uh, countries collaborating. So this is a pretty general model. It doesn't just have to be companies. It could be people. It could be companies. It could be nations here. These one, two, Dan. So we talk about their A activities with the human and tool system supporting them here. Just as down here, there's a human and tool system supporting this activity. So we're trying to say we want to make that organization's primary activity more effective. So in order for that, you have to have some activity there that's recognized and supported. This whole purpose is to improve the augmentation system, to make tools and human system changes that make the A activities more effective. And in a world that's changing rapidly, in which you want this B thing that improves the A capability, you want that to be more and more effective. You have to have something that improves its capability. So we talk about a C capability, in this case, these organizations have gone together to pool the sea level stuff so that collectively you're producing results here that can come up and improve the B capability of each organization so it's better able to make its organization more effective. So what are the practical things? Well, these all start reporting down into this activity. And we talk about this collective community of the distributed networked environment. We talk about a networked improvement community here. So that is a very practical thing to get going today. And we're going to hear more about network improvement communities from our discussant, May Lynn. So, um, again, A, B, C activities, very important part of uh, Doug's uh, vision. And um, uh, when I was working for IBM's Venture Capital Group, I was CTO of IBM's Venture Capital Group. Uh, our office wasn't very far from Doug's house in uh, Menlo Park. And uh, many Friday afternoons, I would uh, show up at his house with a bunch of pizzas and my family would show up and uh, we would have a great time at Doug's on Friday nights talking about collective IQ, talking about life in general. And uh, Doug had a fabulous sense of uh, humor. And this next uh, video that I want to show isn't Doug speaking, but I thought um, 
you know, Doug has inspired so many people. Lots of people talk about Doug and his vision. And I just thought I would share a pretty humorous, what I thought was humorous video of someone talking about Doug's work. So uh, Wolfgang Grolet, uh, take it away. In classic Chevys, right? The good old days of the 50s. You had Marvin Minsky in MIT, and you had Doug Engelbert in Stanford, and those two, that's just had a discussion. In the 50s, they met, and Marvin Minsky was saying, We're going to make machines think, we're going to make machines conscious. And Doug Engelbert's like, What are you doing for the people? What are you doing for the people? <laughs> and then, fast forward about a decade, the Mother of All Demos happened. In 1968, the Mother of All Demos, if you haven't seen this demo, after this video, go check it out. Doug Engelbert debuting the technology that formed the basis of what we do today. The mouse, the cursor, right? Drink. It's amazing stuff. And one of the things it showcases is a shopping list. And Marvin Minsky blasted him. <clears throat> Why are you showing a shopping list? We have machines that can think and do all this for us. It's just another decade. Now, granted, it's been, what, 40 years? 30 years? 40 years. And uh, the most used AI thing goes something like this. Alexa, add this to my shopping list. <laughs> see the screen. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Um, I must have stopped sharing somehow. Future, um, with, uh, with can you see what Kim would have to say, okay, and what I believe that would be, yeah. would be great effort, guys, noble effort there's one small problem. So this man was not a pessimist, um, quite to the contrary, but he was a realist. And, um, and this is what kept him up at night. What does that look like? So basically he thought it's a race. The digital technology revolution is just soaring, the exploding rate and scale of change. On the other hand, um, we have organizations trying to uh, systematically um, improve for the future and become more highly involved. But the explosion of digital technology is really putting a tremendous pressure on the organization's ability to do that. Uh, because it's taken a life of its own, it's on a different trajectory. And so there's so many technologies these days that have not evolved in symbiotic relationship with the organization. There's wonderful emerging technology coming out. On the other hand, who is, who is pioneering those really important capabilities that Doug Engelbart started years ago? So um, to understand this gap is a widening gap. And the um, formation of uh, digital technology is increasing the speed of everything. So it's increasing the speed of all the um, other global issues, including climate change and all of that. And climate change itself is a, is a threat multiplier. It, it, it exacerbates other threats on the planet. The explosion of digital technology unchecked is itself also a threat multiplier. And that gap is a cause for concern. In fact, my father believed that it was extremely serious and that's why he dedicated his entire career to that. The gap itself um, is a, um, is a, it represents a risk 
um, of untold caliber and uh, including the this is an important point Christine is about to make. Um, it's about what is the biggest risk, existential risk to humanity? Is it climate change? Is it cyber warfare? What is it? I can talk clearly the biggest risk is our inability to keep up with the complex surge of problems coming at us. That's the biggest exponential threat. All the others can be addressed if we can uh, create the right augmentation systems to keep up. So here's Christine again. Potential for um, for for uh, collapse, for extinction. On the other hand, it represents an opportunity, a golden opportunity, for really rising to the occasion and getting that capability in our organizations to jump the curve and get ahead of it. So what he saw was the single greatest um, existential challenge of our time, not climate change, not cyber war, not population explosion, the single greatest challenge and opportunity is our ability to raise the curve on our collective ability to collectively solve important problems. So that being the single greatest existential challenge of our time. And that's why he dedicated his life to solving that problem, starting from the beginning and all the technology he prototyped. It was all in the service of pro prototyping the organization of the future that would be flat, fast, and flexible, and highly involved so that it could tackle important problems. And I think they did a pretty good job. Um, but a lot remains to be done. And so this takes us back to the slide that you saw earlier in, the, in that wonderful video. Um, this is the cornerstone of a larger um, strategy that he came up with from the very beginning and refined all throughout his uh, career. So uh, he put it in terms of a bootstrap paradigm map because the idea is that we need to be bootstrapping our capabilities. We need to be bootstrapping our organizations. We need to be bootstrapping our collective IQ. So what are the limiting factors. And what he came up with was the single greatest limiting factor is the paradigms that people bring to looking at the world, how they fit in the world, and where our world needs to go. What are the opportunities for change? So he created a paradigm map. And so all of these tiles on there are what he thought where we needed to shift our paradigm in order to prepare for the future, jump the track, and get on the right trajectory. Um, so it goes around there and all that. So now I, um, one of my jobs has been to try to distill all of that into an actionable strategy that organizations can apply within their own teams and initiatives and um, companies and institutions, um, five accelerators. So I'm not going to go into them in detail tonight. Um, that would be for another time. But it covers all the, um, the key things that he introduced in that video, which are essential to um, to galvanizing that capability and getting them into the hands of the groups and organizations and networked initiatives that are trying to tackle the, um, the toughest challenges. Um, so this brings us to what he thought would, was the greatest opportunity for our time, the greatest opportunity to leverage our collective smarts, to launch a serious effort improving collective IQ. He started that. Um, in the 1960s that it kind of trailed off and what happened. So we, this is really a serious problem and we need a serious effort to do that. Um, focusing also um, how the collective IQ can be leveraged to improve how we improve. That ABC and the way that it's organized, we have to accelerate how we improve, not just improve the capability. So who's the customer for this? Who's the, who's the end customer? So think of it as a network improvement initiative. These are the initiatives like the ones that you're going to hear tonight. It's all the initiatives and organizations that are trying to tackle those toughest problems. And one of the, one of probably the greatest um, opportunity for single point of leverage in all of this is to start networking the people, the organizations, the initiatives that are working on the toughest problems and bring them together to help collectively guide us into this. Um, so... We haven't scratched the surface, and my dad would be the first one to tell you, noble effort. But um, here's another really important point where he was talking about the importance of the co-evolution to a reminder that technology should not aim to replace humans, rather amplify human capabilities, whether it's the individual, whether it's the team, the initiative, the organization, the institution, or society at large. When you think of Doug Engelbart, please, the least important question you can ask about Engelbart is what did he build? The most important question being, what world was he trying to create? Great. So, uh, thank you, Christine. Christina. And now I'm going to uh, shift gears over to um, the slide deck again and share this. Um, oops. Let's see. 
present this, I should say. And let's move on. Thank you, Christina, for that wonderful presentation. Daniel, over to you. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I think my task for this discussion is, is specifically looking at learning and education. But um, that's very much embedded in larger structural changes that are going on in our society and around the world um, that I think Doug Engelbert understood um, far ahead of everyone else, right? Um, he, he was a visionary, uh, an innovator, an inventor, but also um, I think had an ambition for understanding how humans evolve, right? Humans don't just evolve through, uh, you know, uh, competition and survival, we evolve by leveraging tools. And what he was trying to do, I think, is build the tools that would allow us to level up to uh, a stage of history that we're only now starting to understand. Um, so these two quotes, I think uh, Doug Engelbart is famous for this one particular, technology should not aim to replace humans, but rather amplify human capabilities. Um, I came to understand his work in part because I was uh, struggling with understanding um, artificial intelligence and technology and networks. And um, there, there wasn't as many people that were speaking to augmentation, say a decade ago, especially as there are now, in part because the fear of artificial intelligence and in part because I think people are better understanding how we can leverage these tool sets. Uh, I think Steve Jobs understood this very well. Um, he's quite famous for, mention, for recognizing that um, uh, a computer is like a bicycle for the mind in the sense that it provides us with a means to um, augment our capabilities in ways we simply can't do without it. Um, and you know, this, this is rooted in a, an evolutionary history that leverages other tools like um, that language. Uh, language mediates activity and community and uh, sort of the most important um, quality or, or feature of human development, which is collective effort, collective intelligence. Uh, next slide, please. Sir. So um, I did my PhD in the area of public policy, looking at education policy. Um, since then, I branched out in other areas. But um, I think when it's all said and done, what I've really always been looking at is how to leverage technology for collective intelligence. And uh, I think uh, Doug Engelbart understood that better than most, if not uh, certainly more than his contemporaries and probably better than many people today. Um, he, he understood bootstrapping, leveraging technology to level up. And he understood that the nature of technology um, would augment and empower and not necessarily replace or displace. And, um, you know, his, his, his first paper or the first paper I came across, the SRI paper, which um, built a framework for understanding um, collective intelligence as a, as a, uh, innovation or as a system for um, change, transformation. Um, there's a quote that I use often and when I write articles, um, by augmenting human intellect, we mean increasing the capability of man to approach complex problem situation, to, uh, to approach a complex problem situation, to gain comprehension, to suit his particular needs and to derive solutions to problems, men and women, obviously. Um, next slide, please, Jim. So this is, to, to say that um, we are and have been, as a species of tool using hominids, been leveraging technology um, from the beginning of our evolutionary climb. And it has become obvious that um, this is accelerating into a stage of history that it's very difficult for us to fully comprehend. Um, I frame it this way. I mean, we can see the timeline of uh, the, the invention and, and development of the computer, um, which is you know, a tangible example of a set of tools that are highly transformative. Um, but I, I would say if you put this in evolutionary terms or say anthropological terms, I think you could see history in, or evolutionary history in three distinct stages. Um, the agricultural revolution harnessed domesticated animals, animals for pastoral farming and the industrial revolution leveraged machines for factory production. But what we're undergoing now, the computational revolution is advancing tools for augmenting human intelligence. And Doug got that. And, um, and I think now we're starting to really understand it at some level of depth. Next slide, please. Um, this is, you know, uh, uh, an explosion in 
tools and technologies um, in the market, but it's also changing the way our institutions work. And that's where it feeds back into education. Uh, what we're undergoing is a kind of human machine symbiosis. And um, that, that makes us in a sense cyborgs. And I don't think it's going to be at the Borg at a Star Trek. Um, I think it'll be a much more luxurious, comfortable um, and spiritual uh, living experience that um, many of us will enjoy and have already started to enjoy. Um, we're on the cusp of this. And so for, for speculation, it can be difficult, you know, given the speed. I think people that look at Moore's law or um, disruptive change, disruptive technologies have some sense of the S curve, the exponential S curve that underlies um, technological change. But I think what Doug pointed out um, is that it's a question of scale. And scale is, is not just about taking what, where we're at now and leveling it up to where we want to go, but it's scaling everything. It's scaling uh, the infrastructure, scaling our uh, cultural connection, scaling our capacity for innovation and scaling um, our intelligence as a collective species. And um, that's a fascinating thing. So the question becomes, where is this going? What does this human machine symbiosis look like? Uh, please, next slide, please, Jim. And I think um, really the sky's the limit. What we can do with this, these tools will be very dramatic um, if we don't kill ourselves or if we don't, uh, um, uh, if we don't harness them effectively. Um, this, tool mediated, this tool mediated evolution is the basis upon which um, our civilization is now uh, reaching a, a, a new global era, a new, what, what might say, what might say a planetary era. And this planetary, planetary era um, is anchored to computational technologies. Um, and as we move beyond Moore's law and potentially into new forms of computational um, substrates, whether it's DNA or uh, quantum computing, we're going to have an incredible amount of computational power to build new systems. Um, and part of that, or um, half of that, you might say, as Doug understood, will be about the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of collective intelligence. And that's where we need to begin to understand how to redesign um, how we uh, educate ourselves. And I think even the very basis of our understanding of what education is, you know, we have, we're transcending, I think, what was the modern understanding of transferring information or, or data from um, one generation to the next via um, a closed classroom, which is largely built on top of or alongside the, the factory, the industrial um, factory. And I think all of that is now um, in, in some level of uh, disrepute. Um, I think the credibility of these institutions is now uh, unraveling. Next slide, please. So if we look at this structurally, what's happening is that we're shifting from centralized industrial systems, which are linear, to decentralized network systems, which are anchored to platforms, where super nodes like uh, the social media platforms um, become the basis for mediation and collective intelligence. But where we're headed is a highly distributed system in which individual nodes can network in any direction. And that distributed system, I think, is post-platform. I think it's post-institution, at least of the form that we, we've, we've inherited. But what the uh, infrastructure for um, social development and for community and for collective intelligence looks like, you know, beyond the, the technology, the tools themselves, the institutionalization of uh, learning and education. That I'm not sure, I'm not sure what that look, looks like. I know it's rooted in networks, but I don't think it looks like what, we, what the school is today. So as we um, evolve our tools, particularly artificial intelligence, we're going to augment collective intelligence. And that's very difficult, I think, for our uh, stage of history to appreciate or be able to grasp. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I have a lot more to say, but yeah, I think a, a very small role in this discussion. Um, uh, I did an edited volume some years ago on augmented intelligence, looking at uh, the systems of the future that uh, will be leveraged for work and learning. Um, I'm developing a new book, Augmented Education, with a, a colleague from Harvard, Peter Marber. Um, we're basically trying to be better understand um, how augmentation will transform learning. And I think that's critical 
for uh, realizing Doug's dream of collective intelligence and ultimately raising the collective IQ. But um, I think we see some hints of this in um, the distributed ledger technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence networks, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and open source software. This is, um, I think, the basis of where the collective intelligence is going. Um, and I think it's, uh, it'll be an incredible experience. Hopefully, um, I'll be alive long enough to see it really mature. But um, I think uh, a lot of this understanding um, goes to the credit for the understanding this goes to Doug Agelbert. Great. Thank you, Daniel. And I'm going to circle back with a couple questions for you uh, later. Uh, let's uh, have Mei Lin uh, present now. Uh, Mei Lin, over to you. And you might have to come off mute, Mei Lin. Um, Okay, how's that? Can you hear me and see uh, me? We can. Thank you, Mayla. Okay. So, Jim, I remember the Co-Evolution Symposium at IBM Almaden back in 2003. What a wonderful event that was, uh, where Engelbart had the chance to really uh, wow a huge number of people that you have brought together. And uh, you have never the persistence with which you have helped to spread Engelbart's vision is just amazing. So I um, uh, did a little quick picture, a Mercator quick projection of the world. And these are the places that I have lived and worked uh, in my lifetime. I'm an old person, but one of the highlights of my life was in fact to chair Doug Engelbart's uh, core planning committee from 2000 to 2004. And that's when we got to know each other, Jim. So I um, co-founded the People-Centered Internet um, with the thought that Engelbart inspired of me, in me, that the internet is a central, le le central nervous system for the planet and for the world and for us as people. But now, um, you know, 20 years later, I'm wondering, are we heading to the connected global brain? Are we heading to the global nervous breakdown? Um, and so I uh, want to uh, bring up some of the, um, both the, the idea that what Engelbart's vision of augmented intelligence was, was not just, um, it was like fire. The technology, digital technology is like fire. It's great good, but just, it can do some tremendous harm. And do we have the right um, guardrails for this? And so I, really as an individual made the voyage to the digital Xanadu. I was born in Singapore. I lived in all of these places. I uh, went to college in Australia, came to the US and um, got to know Doug. And really the opening of the digital Xanadu, it made me feel like Marco Polo must have felt where this is a completely new world. Next slide, please. But I had come from Singapore. It had been a British colony. I had seen what happens in colonialization. And I wonder about Doug's ideas. They were formulated at a time uh, of, of great hope. Um, he actually grew up on the um, Oregon Trail um, and he had a vision, he talked about the, the digital frontier at the Lewis and Clark Trail. And um, there was this tremendous idea of going into the frontier um, and, and doing all this great stuff. But as I started going back into the rest of the world, I wondered that there were really um, problems happening uh, with what happened with indigenous people in, on this frontier. And so I believe that metaphors like the digital frontier, which we had, um, are leading to land grab behavior on this digital frontier. And in fact, we have to remember that the Amer American frontier actually created incredible destruction and annihilation. And I, ask the question, do we want to see this with um, the global north bringing 
digitization to the global south and saying, adapt or die. <laughs> um, and I don't think it has to be like that. And Engelbart inspired me with the idea of networks of communities sharing and learning with each other. Um, next slide, please. Um, I've, I've highlighted um, for me what Engelbart uh, really um, helped me understand this idea of the fact that digital technology can help us fly off the page. And the idea that, you know, the, the, the story of Flatland where a circle uh, is the manifestation of a sphere in two dimensions, it starts looking just like a dot, becomes a bigger and bigger circle, and then becomes a smaller and smaller circle in that two dimensional plane. And, and I think Engelbart really was saying we can fly off the page now. And the challenge is how can we augment our humanity with digital technology? How can we use these amazing capabilities of storage, longitudinal tracking, the ability to really capture memories in a way that up to digital technology, we had no way to do. Um, so what I work on today is applying the idea of networked improvement communities globally. Um, here in Singapore, where I am right now, we're working on the global public utility for SME financing. SME is small, medium-sized enterprises, because if the whole world is to be producers as well as consumers, then we have all got to be able to use uh, digital technology and imagine how we can improve our communities, how we can have thriving families, resilient communities. And that requires us to take into account many ways of improving and not just the ones we're used to. Um, today, if you look at the top five uh, companies by value in the global stock exchanges, 75% of their value is intangible. Only 20 to 25% is tangible assets, physical assets. This really means that the largest companies can tap funding based on the value of their digital assets. Meanwhile, small businesses can only borrow based on their physical assets. This is a future of increasing the digital divide where, where small business cannot borrow money to grow their companies um, on, on, at a large scale. And so being able to actually have um, small companies be able to bring their digital assets together and use that to convince uh, uh, the finances and lenders to come is, is really an important thing. And that's another part that I'm working on. And finally, um, the idea of uh, digital economics and digital science has really taken root. And so, however, today science is a very reductionist uh, view of the world. If you go back to some of the older societies, you're looking at the mind, body, and the spirit together, and all is one. And this sort of linear uh, reductionist view of science is something that is really being challenged as the world gets connected through the internet. Uh, I think we have to emphasize the importance of the digital humanities and digital social studies to use digital memory storage tracking to understand how we can thrive together and augment our humanity. Next slide, please. So um, here's my call to action. We want a future that future generations want to, uh, want to live in. And here are the things that we're working on at the People-Centered Internet. You can contact us. We've got Project Eagle Feather, which is working with indigenous communities. The leader of that is Matt, Matthew Rantanen, who is one of the most celebrated uh, digital tribal leaders in the country in North America. Uh, received awards from the Internet 2 and the Internet Society. We're working closely um, with him. Project Kaleidoscope, um, we're working with Steve Crocker, who was the chairman of ICANN, as well as Vince Cerf. And we're looking at the Who Is system in the do domain name system, the DNS system. 
We've got the Global Help Desk, which is working with the UN Digital Cooperation Roadmap under the leadership of the UN Secretary General, who in fact is the first electrical engineer to be a Secretary General. Uh, and we have to use digital building blocks, in fact, to do digital cooperation. Otherwise, we, we're, we're, we're creating a Tower of Babel. Uh, uh, I've already touched on digital finance that's uh, happening now, and uh, the IEEE is beginning to um, engage cautiously. Uh, and finally, the idea of clean IT, and working, we're working on that with the Hassel Plattner Institute um, in uh, Potsdam, Germany. Hassel Plattner was the founder of SAP. And um, maybe the easiest way to explain clean IT is, remember plastics? We now have an epic cleanup problem with plastics. We don't want to have that with IT. Let's keep it clean right from the get-go. So thank you, Jim. That's what's happening in the going forward motion of Engelbart's ideas. Come join Wonderful. us. Wonderful. Thank you, Mamie. Wonderful. Thank you. Great examples of network improvement communities trying to tap into and increase collective IQ. Um, so now we're entering the Q&A portion, and um, uh, I, I have some questions, uh, and I would like to go first, if that's all right. Um, Nadini, did you have any questions that you wanted to do first, or should I just jump right in? I jump right in, and then uh, we have some questions that have been coming in on the chat, so I'll pick them up once you're done. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief then, and um, my first question is for Daniel. And um, I am going to, uh, again, this is what I wish I could be discussing with Doug today, the Humankind book by uh, Lester Bregman. And um, if you look at this book, there's this very interesting diagram. And I, I, I probably should have done a slide, but I didn't. But it basically compares a human child to uh, our nearest uh, relatives, uh, chimpanzees and orangutans on several dimensions. One is uh, spatial understanding, calculation, causality, and social learning. And you can see for most perceptual and action tasks, the, um, our, our nearest relatives uh, are as good as a child or, or slightly better. But when it comes to social learning, uh, people are off the chart. And Doug mentioned in, his, uh, in the video that we showed that language was one of the greatest inventions for boosting collective IQ. And, it, and I wonder whether social learning came first or whether language came first. Probably they co-evolved along with our brains. If you, if you um, look at the literature, that's, the, uh, that's uh, the answer. But I think Doug's view of people was very, very high. And I think especially in the area of augmented learning, there's a breakthrough coming. There's something as profound as what deep learning was for artificial intelligence. There's something that's profound coming on the augmented learning side. And Daniel, I just was wondering if, if you see the social learning as like uh, some, uh, our superpower that um, can be combined with digital technology in some way to, to even go to uh, higher levels. And I just wanted to ask you your thoughts on that. Yeah, I do. Um, I think that uh, one of the capacities of networks that this, this era we're entering is the ability for um, self-organizing collective intelligence to facilitate something like swarm learning or swarm innovation. And I think that uh, you see that in the open source community, for example, you see that in what blockchain is trying to do. You see that in the scalability of networks. And I think we haven't yet found scalability and learning like that, because our infrastructure, essentially our institutions, were built in a different era, right? Very effective in, an, in, a, in, a, in a, historically speaking, not effective today relative to the tools available. And I think what Doug understood is that um, humans are very plastic, right? The human species has massive capacity because we evolve when challenged, right? We're, we're anti-fragile, to use a very um, you know, common phrase today. And so, Often what happens in the marketplace is, uh, and it, it, it's not just you know, to blame capitalism per se, but you know, institutions dumb down things because they want to simplify. And there's value in that for sure, but they can also limit the capacity for evolution, right? And that's, that's not good. 
And I think Doug grasped that, that we will level up when the tools are ready and the tools are clearly, clearly being incubated. So I think um, you know, the shorthand answer would be yes, something like a self-organizing self collective intelligence is coming that will be rooted in learning um, that mirrors something like the open source world. Yeah, and I just want to build on what you said about leveling up because I want people to really understand that and how profound Doug's insights were into that. Because I remember when I was in high school, you know, I was born in the 50s. I'm an old guy, 65 years old. But I had to learn typing in high school. And, I, and it took months to get my speed up. And when my kids growing up in Silicon Valley had keyboards in every room of the house, they never took a typing class. And they can type faster than I can. What is going on? It's social learning. It's, it's this leveling up. And, and when it happens with culture, you don't even notice it. It's just suddenly there's this new confidence that, you know, <laughs> appears in the world. And I think Doug saw that and had such a high regard for people. He understood that there's so many things like that that our human capabilities can go so much higher. And social learning is a key part of that. And Maylin, I see you smiling. Did you want to comment on this as well, this question? I was remembering Doug Engelblatt himself as a 12-year-old um, actually rebuilding a Model T Ford. Um, and he was a very, very bright young person, but he was the son of a single mother, and they didn't have much money. And uh, he found an abandoned Model T Ford and he um, got the people in the local automotive shop to help him. And so even at the a young age himself, he was able to bring this in collective intelligence and bootstrap his own learning. Uh, I just think that that experience made him uh, understand what was possible. And uh, two years later, it ran. The Model T board worked. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Um, so Nandini, we'll uh, head over to you if there's other questions from the chat. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Thank you, Ben. Sure. Uh, there's the two questions on collective intelligence, and I'll try to sort of combine them. Uh, so somebody in the audience wants uh, anybody to share some more insights about collect collective intelligence networks. And a few examples for augmentative collective intelligence and associated learning. I will go first because, um, as I mentioned, I, I lead IBM Open Source Data and AI Initiative uh, before I retire later this year because I'm 65. And um, the open source communities are an example of collective intelligence. I work practically every day with Google. Facebook, Amazon, Intel, NVIDIA, IBM, we're all in here working on building the next generation of AI infrastructure together. And um, we compete <laughs> viciously out there, but we're part of the Linux Foundation AI and Data building open source, and that is an example of collective intelligence. Um, I think it was Bill Joy at Sun said, no matter how many smart people you hire at your company, the world is going to be smarter. There's more smart people outside your organization than inside your organization. And just as Doug, uh, you know, when, he, when you look at that human side, you know, he could have open source communities on the human side. That's a human innovation that allows us all to get the benefits of pooling our collective intelligence. And uh, so I would say open source communities, if you want a concrete example, you can anchor on for collective intelligence. Uh, and network improvement communities, open source is one. I mean, that is the way software is developed in the world today. The world runs on open source software. The telecoms use ONAP. Uh, the AI systems use PyTorch and TensorFlow and, and Jupyter Labs. Open source is one. It is the development model for software. And you can think of GitHub, which Microsoft acquired. We acquired Red Hat. Microsoft acquired GitHub as like Wikipedia for code. You can type into GitHub. If you don't have a GitHub account, get a GitHub account, type in Chinese poetry, and you'll have, you know, I don't know, dozens of 
code examples of software that automatically generates Chinese poetry, analyzes Chinese poetry, any topic you want. It's like type in something you type into Wikipedia and see what the code version of it is on GitHub. And that's part of our building our collective IQ. It's not just that we're working together. It's like we're exponentially increasing the amount of open source software that does amazing things in the world together. Uh, so that would be my example. Uh, I see Maylin smiling again. Do you want to jump next and then Daniel? Maylin? Yes, there's a terrific example in the United States and uh, in recognition of the Open Health Systems Laboratory that is in health. So networked improvement communities have their largest instantiation in the federally qualified health centers, uh, uh, which, which are partially funded by the Department of Health and Human Services. And these are independently operated uh, 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 centers, health centers, that coordinate uh, their sharing and learning uh, on, on different topics like uh, diabetes, healthy weight, uh, asthma. And by being on the same um, rhythm and beat of improvement, they're able to really expand the improvement, the way uh, problems are solved. For example, in asthma, they're really able to reduce the incidence of childhood asthma attacks by working together to e essentially stop idling trucks around the country who are causing asthma attacks by being parked on for, for children on the way to school. These are things that can be done. And the example of federally qualified health centers is a wonderful way in which they're able to actually address some of the social determinants of health. So even though the National Institute of Health does clinical research, not that much research is spent on the social determinants of health and network improvement communities are the ideal way to go after this. This is validated by the work we did with the US Department of Defense looking at the future of health, that network improvement communities were a way to have highest quality health most sustainable and most affordable. It's gonna take years before we actually do it, but the seeds have been planted. Thank you. Daniel, any thoughts before I take the next question? Um, I, I guess my only thought would be to refer back to the issue of um, moving from centralized systems to decentralized, ultimately distributed systems. The, 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 the real profound um, opportunity that arrives with this new technological infrastructure is lateral scale. So the, it's not necessary to go through centralized command and control systems anymore. And the, the consequence of that is that uh, learning and ideas and um, cultural connection proliferate at a much, uh, at a scaled level, you know, at, at an order of magnitude more than could have done, could have been done, many order, orders of magnitude more than could have been done through centralized command and control systems. That's very bad for centralized systems, which are, are, are quickly being outpaced by platforms and ultimately by something like a blockchain infrastructure. Um, but I think it, it, you know, when we get a handle on this, when we're able to institutionalize it without curbing it, um, the possibilities, not just for learning and education, but for health and for uh, work and for connection, for community, um, is going to be pretty fantastic. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, Daniel, I think the next question uh, I'll direct at you. It says, as students and learners, what, do you, what steps can we take uh, towards sort of this whole idea of augmenting human intelligence? Oh, there's a lot of things. I mean, go to school, get a degree, but recognize that um, that's probably not going to be sufficient, right? It's necessary, but not sufficient because it, it's, it gives you opportunity to be among like-minded people in a space that you might enjoy, whether it's engineering or literature or philosophy. But what you really need to be thinking about is being entrepreneurial. And I think that involves networks. You want to be among the networks of um, creative people that are building the future. One of the problems with, say, the MBA, not to knock it, I did take some MBA classes in um, grad school, is that it's teaching um, to an old centralized command and control model, right? The, the bureaucrat in the industry. That's not going to be very valuable um, as we scale. It's actually getting in the way. And so if we look at the platform economy, which is just the, the most recent emergent um, function or feature of the network era, you're much better off if you just become um, a part of networks of contributors, uh, user, user producers, rather than um, get the right 
credentials. It helps. I got a PhD. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, I valued my experience, but I don't think it's enough for the next era. Uh, Jim or Malin, any thoughts about that or? Yes, I say. Okay, go ahead. Go to TikTok. <laughs> I, I think TikTok is one of the most exciting uh, new emergent uh, learning systems. And there's even food talk where, where people are actually learning to cook with each other. I, I, these are really fascinating emerging things um, and go don't don't just constrain yourselves to formal institutions go to youtube go to tiktok there's a lot of stuff out there that's good steer away from the bad stuff can i just yeah, ask a follow-up sorry go ahead jim and then I'll, i just want to push on this question a little more Sure, sure. I, I agree. I, I don't think anybody, uh, you know, anytime I've got a question about a technological thing, uh, I go to YouTube. Uh, anytime I'm doing a home repair, I go to YouTube. And it's because of the social learning. We're wired for social learning. And I can learn so much by watching somebody else show me how to do something. And uh, whether it's a home repair, whether it's uh, using a new feature in a programming language, whether, whatever it is, I'm going to learn it through uh, my uh, YouTube channel. And I also just want to amplify what uh, uh, Daniel said. Upskilling is the new normal. And, and it's about entrepreneurial skills. And we call them T-shaped skills in the service science community. And um, by the way, it was uh, Ray Fisk who, uh, from the service science community that recommended I read this book because he knew I'd love it. And and it's that social learning. And if you think of a world, imagine a world where, where everybody's a genius, but they're in their own silo. Like they're all Isaac Newtons or Albert Einsteins, but they never share and can learn from each other. Versus a world where people are more, you know, average. Maybe there's an occasional <laughs> you know, genius, but we can learn super fast from each other. Well, that world of copiers, <laughs> you can spread new innovations and new capabilities much, much faster than if you had geniuses who didn't have social learning capabilities. So, so I think, you know, it, it really behooves us to think about upskilling and entrepreneurial skills and, and getting badges and learning skills on our own. And as Daniel said, I've got my PhD. There's nothing wrong with getting a degree. That's a great thing if, 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 it, if you can do it and if you have the funding and whatever it takes, but opportunities but there's just so much we can do, especially the next generation, uh, just tapping into what's freely available out there. And uh, I think Doug would, would amplify that, that we're, we're entering this era of ability to learn like never before. So over to you. So I'll just, have, I, it's a follow-up question uh, to Daniel. You know, you're talking about the value of a degree. Um, if you think about young children in school, they're taught to be social and they learn from each other. And then you get to the stage, especially, I mean, I'll talk about the Indian system where it's competitive. Uh, and then you go back into the real world and you work and you're asked to, uh, you know, talk about solving problems, the whole idea of interdisciplinarity. You keep having to shift. Uh, so is, is there something we can do within the education system? You know, how do we, um, have that structured learning, but also the unstructured learning, which you will need uh, if you want to get you know, to the whole idea of collective. So, you know, the hard problem is that you're essentially asking, how do our old institutions, which were created for a different era, adapt to a new era? Yeah. And the problem is they can't, unfortunately. We're gonna to need to build new institutions, but we're not entirely sure what those will be. What we have is rudimentary social platforms that facilitate lateral networking. And that's very valuable. It creates self-organizing collective intelligence. But we're going to need to create authorizing institutions that validate um, social learning. And part of the problem, I think, and this is a sort of barb criticism, is that in academia, there's a certain vested interest in maintaining these old clerical systems. And so everybody's specialized, they're proud of that specialization, they wanna maintain it. But it's built for the modern era. In fact, it's pre-modern. Right, it's actually a, you know the, the uh, Catholic institution in a sense, 
But what we need, I guess, you know, if we're going to speak to academia is a post-industrial version, a version that leverages networks. And I think that that will occur, that will evolve. That's an emergent function of, you know, social development. Um, but we do need to spend some time, um, uh, like Doug did, to construct what these new institutions will look like. Um, just as a, as an, uh, you know, a uh, shout out, I guess, Max Borders, um, he's written a book called The Social Singularity, which I like quite a bit. And I think um, insights uh, around, so for example, we understand the singularity as uh, a fear or a, a point of stress that artificial intelligence will outstrip humanity and that we'll all be subjugated in some Terminator form. But the truth is, that I think that Doug understood, is that we're going to evolve together with AI, with these technological systems. And But to do that, we need to build new social institutions as well. And so that's where I think there is a disconnect. We, we I, I think there's a, um, a real desperate need to begin to think about what these new institutions should look like. And I honestly think academia has done a poor job of trying to understand this. Um, Maylin or Jim, any thoughts or? Okay, uh, there's a question for Maylin. Are there other avenues uh, your organization, People Centered Internet is looking forward to working on? Oh, wow. I thought that that was a pretty comprehensive list. We've got a lot on our plate. Um, I really think that the idea of network improvement communities and the global help desk is where we can make the most difference. And what I'm looking forward to doing in the coming year is working with WISIS, the World Summit and the Information Society. Um, there's So this year, WISIS was 43% women, and they have a goal to make it 50% women next year. And I think we, within the People Centered Internet, will be looking at how women can both be participants, 50% participants and 50% speakers. Uh, the reason why I think it's so important that the women should participate is that um, there are so many things that women pay attention to that are not part of what um, technology is paying attention to. But now with COVID, many business leaders have spent more time with their families and at their homes than they ever in their whole life. So I think the understanding about the multitasking that women do, the, the amount that we actually need to do to look after our elders and our children and those who are not fully uh, up individually standalone capable, um, all of that is much clearer to businesses and their business opportunities. And so I look forward to actually having the voices of women and the things that women pay attention to simply by being mothers, uh, that this will be much more part of the mainstream going forward. And I'll be working closely with the ITU and the 30 UN agencies that are part of the World Summit and the Information Society to, to put the voices of women there. Great. Um, I think this is another question uh, that came up from uh, the conversation about financing. In this current COVID-19 scenario, you, you can see many small and medium businesses struggling to survive. Uh, so what is your message for them to sustain? It's not easy. It's really, really not easy. Um, different countries are really constrained in how much they can help their small businesses. And it's really, really clear, just as it, the educational institutions are failing our learners, uh, current lending institutions are failing small businesses. Small businesses have had to shut down and not be able to operate because of shelter in place and um, the you know, shutdowns for COVID. Um, many of them have had to not take revenues um, for a whole year, maybe 15 months. Um, we as a global community have to do more to uh, make financing available. I, I think of this in a really personal way, a pushcart vendor in Indonesia who's selling chicken rice, right? Um, as COVID goes down, she's gonna have more customers, but she can't borrow the money to buy that extra chicken for the additional customers that she has customers for. Um, 
if in fact a lender was really aware of the rise in demand over the last week, it's not a big risk to lend her money to buy that extra chicken every day. We have digital information that can really lower the risk of lending and we need to act on it. If we don't act on it, we are looking at chasms in society that are have-nots are seeing no path forward. And we can fix this. We have the ingredients we have to cook. I made this speech at the World Bank on the need for global SME financing, and we can act on it, and I'm driving it as hard as I can. Great. Thank you, Maylin. Um, are there any other uh, thoughts from Jim or Daniel? Um, just that uh, agility is and resilience is also uh, part of this upskilling. So um, there's always going to be obstacles that come up, and it's but there's always opportunity as well. And it's part of our. I think this would be part of the cultural change that Doug talked about is becoming more agile to shift from an area maybe that's run into obstacles to an area where there's opportunity. Can't always do that. And I know there's a lot of suffering out there where that's not feasible. But I, I do think from a Doug's vision perspective, building up resilience is this ability to switch agilely, switch. If we can upskill quickly to new areas of high demand, you know, a door closing is a door opening somewhere else. Yeah, I have a thought on that as well, which is that right. um, uh, I think that digital money, cryptocurrencies, are part of the incubation of a new financial infrastructure that could allow for uh, microfinancing that bypasses centralized systems and has less need for um, gatekeepers, right? Um, this swarm capital that you see sort of attacking the financial industry at the moment um, is part of a revolution in uh, financing. It just take, will take time for it to mature. You know, a simple way of putting it is that um, the pyramids that, of bureau bureaucrats that built our society are now, in a sense, in the way. And what we need to do instead is build infrastructure, both digital and social, that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer systems uh, at the micro level to network acro laterally across every popul uh, populations of the world, every domain, every institution. It'll take time. But on the other side of it, um, I don't think we'll have the kinds of problems we're facing now with the, with the, with the pandemic. Um, I'm looking at the time. We have another seven minutes. Uh, Anil, do you have any questions would you, uh, for our panel? No, uh, uh, very happy to listen to all the wonderful yeah. thoughts. All right. Okay. Uh, no, no other questions from the audience? Uh, this one, I'll ask one more question that's here. Um, it says augmenting collective emotional intelligence uh, is needed at decision-making levels. Uh, how can AI help here? I'll jump in. Uh, I know this okay. is a question for Daniel. I'm not sure it's AI that I want to bring forward. But collective emotional intelligence is going to be really, really key for us to move forward as because otherwise we'll have that global nervous breakdown instead of having a harmonious glo global brain. There's a new book out by Daniel Kahneman uh, called Noise, N-O-I-S-E. And the idea of noise is in fact that there is so much we can learn from the, um, from making our understanding of patterns and, and our lack of uh, human judgment uh, that's really causing us problems. And actually the field of psychiatry has the most noise, uh, particularly because of this issue of understanding what is emotional intelligence and how we can apply it well. So collective emotional intelligence, in fact, I, I would say is one of the real, um, uh, uh, power levers and the book noise points out how to use it. So I highly recommend that. Um, 
Thank you. Daniel, do you want to jump in? I'm um, sure. Um, I think the way I would translate that. So for example, I don't think AI um, will scale feelings. I don't think it'll scale community based on relationships. I mean, it'll help because it'll create, it'll mediate um, community. But I think to scale feelings, you need uh, culture. And I think at, this, at the moment, we are struggling with the uh, disconnect, a misunderstanding, and have been probably throughout history, between all the different cultures that have evolved with different sets of tools. To give you know, only one small example, the fight between China and Asia to talk about harmony and the West talking about human rights and democracy, right? They're both actually really valuable but they tend to speak past each other because their histories are so different, right? The sets of tools they've leveraged to develop community and civilization are very different. But instead of recognizing that in those differences, there's some higher unity that could be found, right? Sort of bridging, they tend to fight. And so the consequence is that we wait around for these different civilizational blocks to figure out that they're both actually pretty good. And so I think it'll take time for cultures to sort of enter intermarry, so to speak, and hybridize. So I think in the end, culture will be the form of scaled feelings, a single but complex global culture. But again, that takes time. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have a few minutes. I'll maybe go around the panel and ask you for a 30 second or a one minute sort of ending. Maybe what would Doug say now? I'll start with Jim. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, maybe just share this one or two slides here where um, I don't know if you can see my screen or not, but um, let me just uh, try to share this. So I think we are all going to be augmented by hundreds of digital workers. So if you're an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley and you're thinking, how can I hire my next data scientist, AI researcher? You know, over the next 20 years, you can see the cost of a digital worker going down, which is going to lead to this incredible GDP per employee. So think about yourself augmented. Like what if you had a staff of 100 digital workers working for you? Imagine being augmented with that capability. Um, that is, that's where we're headed. And as we get augmented like that, even, even children are going to be augmented with digital workers. And so education is going to change. Government for better decision making, some of the points Daniel. Um, I'm very optimistic about the future, and I really do believe um, if, if you take away one thing from Doug's words, it is understand this augmentation system idea, because it's about over the next 20 years, it's going to even further transform our lives as we're augmented. And I'll just end with, you know, it's two communities of trust, the artificial intelligence we've got to trust, and also um, for those of us who work in the service science community, it's about trust and co-creation. So uh, remember Doug said augmentation systems are the way we're going to get to collective IQ. Uh, Daniel? Daniel? Um, yeah, I think that one of the things I take away from Doug, take away from Doug's work um, is the value of scale. So um, we can see in silicon and in technology, whether it's Moore's law or whatever replaces Moore's law, um, the scaling of technology in dramatic ways. But what Doug understood and re the real tragedy at the moment is that it's much harder to scale the social systems. And so building an interface between the social systems and the technological systems is becoming um, uh, a real challenge, you know, a challenge that I think will be will be met, but um, it's part of the uh, the, the post-industrial era that we're um, we're trying we're wrestling with, and I think uh, to Doug's credit, in trying to build the interface between these uh, these different halves of evolution, you know, was a really brilliant and and um, insightful and and virtuous I think thing that he did, and I hope there are more Dougs to come along because we're going to need them. Maylene, you have the last word. Yes. Um, you know, when human beings invented writing in the West, the Phoenicians invented writing, and then they lost it for 800 years because writing was so threatening. To be able to write was so threatening to the existing 
power infrastructures that, that in fact was lost. And Homer and the Iliad and Odyssey was a way for the oral tradition to carry human knowledge over that gap. Um, Douglas Engelbart has invented an idea of digital augmentation of human collective intelligence. We see that that is threatening the existing power structure, just like writing did. We stand at the cusp of potentially losing this big insight, maybe for maybe not 800 years, maybe 50 or 100 years, if we don't seize the opportunity to come together as a people, the people of the world, to steward our planet and to care for each other and create the trusted networks and the relationships that will allow us to support each other moving forward and make a better world for future generations. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was a really passionate call to action, Mei Ling. Um, thank you. And I'm going to hand this now back to Koninika for the vote of thanks, I think. Koninika, your mic is on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so thank you. And all good things must come to an end, but hopefully it's only a pause here and we can continue this conversation further. And I'd like to really uh, thank our speakers, Dr. Spora, Dr. Araya, Dr. Fung, and also Ms. Engelbert for being uh, here today and sharing uh, Doug Engelbert's vision, his philosophy and his legacy with us, bringing it, introducing us to it and bringing it alive for us. So thank you very much. I, uh, I'm sure this has been as fascinating for the audience as it has been for me. And one of the quotes that I liked very much while reading up about Doug Engelbert was something very simple, very simply said, but it encompasses the values and the complexities that he was, he has been working with. And, it's beautifully said as the better we get at getting better, the faster we will get better. I think that was <laughs> very nice. So uh, although we are very sorry, uh, Christina Engelbert couldn't join us today. We are very happy that she did uh, and thankful that she did join us through her video. And, and I'm very grateful to Dr. Nandini Kannan for chairing, agreeing to chair this session. And as she uh, spoke earlier, that it is really these bilateral and global connections and uh, networking that we do that we can go ahead and enhance our capabilities, our potentials, and really intelligence to solve complex problems. So I hope that these uh, collaborations do happen in a meaningful way uh, for the future. I would like to thank uh, the India International Center and particularly Ms. To Chung for always providing an open platform for uh, talks and discussions across disciplines, whether they're controversial or not. Politically, they're always there. And of course, the success of this web meeting wouldn't be uh, for, had it not been for Andrew Deutsch, uh, Samta Sharma, Kopal Sharma, and Ajinkya Singh, who have been working tirelessly to organize and get this meeting going. And last but not the least, I wish to thank our audience and for being here across timelines and being here with us and hearing about Doug Engelbert. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Fun, fun time. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Bye. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Yes.